in the beginning, God created the world, the sky, and he created the earth. And the earth at this stage had no form or shape, and it was in darkness. And so God said, let there be light upon the earth. And God saw the light and it was good. And he separated the darkness from the light. And the light he called morning or, or daytime. And that was the first day. And then God said, Let there be space between the waters in the heavens and the waters on the earth. And so God created the world and the skies above it. And that was the second day. And then God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered into one place so that the land appears, the dry land. And God named the earth, the land, and he saw the seas and the land and he said it is good. And God blessed the land and said, let it bring forth uh, many kinds of vegetation and growing things that might spread over the earth. And let trees bring forth fruit and seed that it might spread and drop and grow new trees that they may spread over the earth and it was good and God said it was blessed and good and let many different sorts of vegetation grow many seeds and plants the whole variety I can't enumerate here but you know and you've seen it in your life and the so many names of so many things, such an abundance of vegetation across the world. So that trees could bear fruit to eat and the fruit would spread over the earth and so many growing things would spread to the four corners of the earth. And that was the third day. And then God said, uh, let there be lights in the sky and these lights will separate the daytime from the night time so that there might be a succession of day and night and God created it and he saw so that people could see the lights in the sky and see them as signs of wonder and amazement. And that was the fourth day. And God said, let the seas uh, bring forth many living things and let there be a bounty within the seas of fish and things over the water and under the water and so many different swimming and gulping and and so many different things in the sea an amazing variety and also let them spread and let birds spread in the air that's above the seas in a multitude of varieties flying and spreading over the face of the earth. And God saw that it was good and blessed.
that they'd spread over the earth, more and more birds. And that was the fifth day. And then God said, let the earth bring forth a multitude of crawling and creeping things and animals and so many different varieties of creatures from the very smallest to the very largest uh, wild animals and tame animals and let them spread over the whole earth and there were so many different sorts of animals I can't even start to enumerate them here but you know the variety of so many creatures upon the earth. And they spread, and they spread to the corners of the earth. And God saw it, that it was good. But he said, let's make human beings so that they might rule over and control the birds and the animals and all the creatures. That had spread over the face of the earth, that they might exercise dominion over them. And let's make these people in our own image so that they're like us. And males and females, let us make them men and women, so that they might have children and their line might spread and disseminate across the whole world. And God said, I'm giving to you all the creatures and animals and insects and everything that's spread over the earth to be to be your food for the so that they may eat the trees the fruit that comes from the trees and the animals may eat the grass that grows and all the vegetation may be food for the so many different sorts of creatures and it spread and they were spread and all the creatures that breathe were spread across the earth and God saw it and it was good, the things that he'd made. And that was the sixth day and not yet the seventh day. That's for later. God made our world beautiful. And right from the beginning, men and women and children have seen the beauty and the majesty of creation. There can hardly be any of us who haven't walked on the beauty of the Peak District, the Yorkshire Dales, the Lake District, or over Dartmoor, or wherever you see beauty and nature around you who hasn't somehow felt that sense of thankfulness and awe and wonder at how marvellous this world is. And sometimes when we travel and go further afield, we get to see more and more of that beauty. I'm thinking to myself of looking out over the River Gambia in equatorial Africa, I'm thinking of looking down from an aeroplane over vast expanses of ocean and land. I'm thinking of standing and looking at the sheer force of Niagara Falls. These things humble us and cause us to say, great is God. But you know, it wasn't until I was a small boy in the 1960s that we first saw that photograph of the Earth from space and we got to see the small, beautiful blue ball.
and beautiful though that picture is, the earth now is not the same as the time when those first photographs and videos were taken. The air and the seas have changed as a result, which is causing climate change. In 1990, we had the first IPCC report on climate change, which warned us of the risks of climate change. By 2019, three years ago, carbon dioxide emissions had risen by 60% from the levels we were warned about in 1990. And our seas are awash with plastic. And our air is dirty and full of toxins, causing us allergies and all manner of problems. The sea levels begin to rise, putting whole nations at risk and many smaller people groups suffering flooding and extreme weather conditions. We human beings have a lot to answer for. We've started to spoil the beautiful world God gave us. Instead of looking after it and caring for it, we've broken it. Instead of taking care and using only what we need, we've greedily seized the world's resources and used them for ourselves. Often fighting over them, like the world's oil or, or mineral resources. So we have such things as oil wars and conflict diamonds. The world as God made it is broken. But you know, God doesn't want to leave it there. God cares for us and he cares for his world. I want us to watch now an animation that was produced by Tia Fund about a year ago. And it shows how God deals with broken things. It's annoying how easily we break things. <laughs> what good is something that's broken? And what about the things we break, that we can't throw away? The people we hurt? The situations we mess up? The unjust structures that we ignore? The ways we exert power over the poor? When it's played out on a global scale, it does more than just cause us pain as individuals. Communities, cities, Nations suffer and struggle, compete, and even fight. And this brokenness damages the planet itself. We are careless with this precious earth. We are greedy for all it gives. Natural resources are used up and fought over. The earth groans and suffers. This brokenness is where poverty comes from. Poverty isn't just a lack of money. It is a deep brokenness in the world that we experience in all kinds of ways. In hunger and insecurity, thirst and a lack of education, loneliness, sickness, violence and hopelessness. Our relationships with each other are damaged. Our relationship with the physical world is damaged. Even our relationship with ourselves, because we don't know who we are or where we belong. At the heart of all this brokenness is our broken relationship with God, who made everything in love and made it good. We have pulled away from Him and from His ways, and we are left diminished 
unsure of who we are or what we can do. All of us are affected, but some of us suffer more than others. What do we do with so much brokenness? Is that just the way it has to be? We believe that God has always been interested in mending things. And in Jesus, God came close and showed us how. Jesus doesn't just patch things up. The cross and the resurrection make possible a whole new creation. Not by throwing the old things away, but by redeeming and restoring them. And as we continue to be restored and healed, and our relationships are restored, God invites us to join His work. We get to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation and restoration, and it transforms all of those broken relationships with others, with the physical world, with ourselves, and with God. It's a ministry that is bigger than us, this is God's story and God's work. And one day, we believe it will reach its climax when Jesus returns and ushers in a life of wholeness for everyone once more. So you see, it's in Jesus Christ that God repairs his broken world. Jesus is God's first and most important response to the brokenness in this world. But of course, Jesus, with his arms stretched out in, on the cross, showing God's love, doesn't sort out the issues of CO2 in our atmosphere. It doesn't sort out the pollutions in the oceans. There's something yet to be done. And that's why God recruits us to work alongside him in his redeeming of all of creation. And so it is that if we love Jesus and we follow Jesus, our hearts will be aflame for the world he's given us. We'll want to live our own lives in ways that minimises the damage that we call cause to this beautiful world. We'll want to maybe stand up against some of the abuses in this world and against this world, especially when it hurts God's poor ones, those people perhaps in the less advantaged nations those people who find their country challenged, but without the benefits that we have of cars and transport and all the other things. So as we consume the world's resources, they pay the price. Maybe we might take up a banner or think hard when we go to make our votes or decide which politicians we want to represent us. And maybe too, we're being called to take our part in seeing change in this world. How can the laws we make for our country maybe reduce the amount of carbon that does this damage to God's beautiful world? How can we try and get ourselves from being the cause of the damage to being part of the solution. From the 31st of October to the 12th of November this year, world leaders will be gathering in Glasgow for the COP26, 
Climate Summit. It's an important opportunity where decisions can be made that can change ours and our children's lives in the future. It's an opportunity for mankind to decide whether to exploit and spoil God's planet or to act as responsible stewards. And so we as Christians are praying. We're praying for change of hearts. We pray that people will turn and follow God's intended way. And as well as praying, we protest and prophesy. We speak God's word into the situation. We call for love, for reconciliation, for peace and for justice and for good stewardship of this world. So let's pray now for that event. Heavenly Father, as the leaders of the world prepare to gather in Glasgow, we pray, Lord, that you, they would melt, you would melt their hearts with a deep appreciation of your world and that it is and we pray, Lord, you would melt their hearts into repentance over the ways the nations have exploited and used this world without any due regard for how they hurt others or hurt the planet itself. Lord, our world is so vulnerable. There is such a thin layer over the top in which we can live, which is fit for human beings kilometre or so below the ground it's too hot for us to live a couple of kilometres up too high we'd freeze to death and die from lack of air help us to look after this thin layer around the earth that you've given us to be our home in Jesus name And you know, in my experience, a good attitude towards God's creation starts with giving thanks. So now, let's give thanks to God for the beauty and majesty of his creation. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord For all you've given to me For all the blessings that I can
Thank you, Lord. 